Ladies and gentlemen, we are at a facility owned by Mr. Jerry Gavai. I don't know if Jerry's around. But Mr. Gavai and other Guyanese over the years participated in an institution I had something to do with as a professor at National Defense University. And I often talked about Miles Law, named after a gentleman, Rufus Miles. Rufus Miles made famous a proposition which we are beginning to see here now. We're beginning to see the application of Miles' law in relation to what does Brexit mean. What Miles, Rufus Miles said is where you stand depends upon where you sit. From the vantage point of a British High Commissioner, sitting in one place, Brexit has these implications. From the vantage points of the Foreign Minister of Guyana, Brexit means something else. We're going to go now to see where CARICOM sits. In hearing from Ambassador Colin Grandison, what his interpretation of some of the implications of Brexit means for CARICOM. Colin, welcome. Um, Madam Chair, uh, members of the High Table, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Uh, the Vice Chancellor started off by cautioning us that foreign policy based on unreality is dangerous. At the moment, the only reality is uncertainty. The only thing that is certain is uh, uncertainty. But we can't wait for reality to manifest itself. Uh, we can't uh, wait for reality to intrude and to have an impact on us. Therefore, we need to see to what extent we can look down the road and to try to identify what are some of the effects of Brexit on the Caribbean community. Uh, this is uh, so all the more because of the long-standing and very close relations that uh, CARICOM has had with the United Kingdom. Uh, the High Commissioner spoke of the Caribbean pivot, and uh, I'll simply say yes, it was a Caribbean pivot, uh, but there was a pivot by the UK government because there was a sense, certainly from the CARICOM side, uh, that over the past 10 years or so, there was a certain distancing, a certain disinterest. Uh, it's therefore, it's quite clear that uh, because of these concerns, as I said, we need to look down the road to the extent to the extent possible. Uh, we believe uh, that uh, we can look at uh, the implications in a number of large uh, categories, political, diplomatic, uh, economic and financial, developmental. Um, I'll also say a quick word about uh, the British Overseas Territories, uh, which are associate members and members of CARICOM. Uh, there's a sense that uh, the initial focus of the United Kingdom is going to turn inwards and it's going to have to recalibrate its external relations. Uh, it's, it's quite possible, therefore, and the point was made by uh, Foreign Minister Greenwich, that uh, perhaps, I say perhaps, that uh, far less interest may be, played, may be paid to certain regions that uh, from a security and a strategic point of view are far less important. Uh, we know that certainly for the EU at this moment uh, that uh, what is taking place in Africa and Africa as a market uh, is certainly far more important than the, the Caribbean community. Uh, yes, it will be turning inwards, but there is also a countervailing argument that because the UK will be freed of the constraints uh, that uh, result from its membership of the European Union, that it will be far freer uh, to be able to develop its historic ties. And the, the Caribbean community, obviously, would be part of these historic ties. Uh, very important, I, I mention it very quickly because uh, Foreign Minister Greenwich spoke to this uh, uh, in some detail. CARICOM is going to lose a sympathetic and supportive voice in the councils of the EU. Not that we always thought that the UK was 100% uh, behind us and our concerns and interests, uh, but we know we could speak to them 
I mean, knew that uh, they would understand the concerns that we were putting forward. The exit is taking place at a time when the European Union is in the midst of two major policy debates. One has to do with uh, the relations uh, between the EU and uh, the ACP, African, Caribbean and Pacific States, uh, after 2020, the end of the Cotonou arrangements. Uh, the second major policy debate of great importance for us is uh, the development policy. Uh, we know that the developed countries uh, over the past few years have categorized the CARICOM member states as middle income countries. And because uh, we are supposed to have done, or we have done much better uh, than many of uh, the developed nations in the world, we have been graduated, graduated from easy access to concessional financing. And without concessional financing, uh, there are obviously lots of hurdles uh, with regard to high cost uh, projects uh, such as infrastructure. It's already quite clear that uh, the EU is uh, moving in this direction. And as I said, in the absence of the, of the UK, uh, we believe uh, that uh, our concerns with regard to graduation and to what the EU calls differentiation uh, could very well become a reality. There's also another dimension uh, that hasn't been mentioned as yet. Uh, as you know, there's a very large Caribbean diaspora in the UK. And uh, during uh, the meeting uh, between CARICOM foreign ministers and the foreign minister of, uh, of the United Kingdom at the end of April, the issue was raised of the treatment of Caribbean immigrants. Many of them have been in, uh, in, have been in the UK for the longest while, when I say longest while, persons uh, who emigrated in the 50s and uh, the 60s. And many of them have not been paying attention to the changes in immigration laws. And some of them have been finding themselves having run afoul uh, of the immigration laws uh, with the threat of being deported hanging over their heads. Uh, this is something obviously that we're going to have to take into account. And uh, the CARICOM High Commissioners uh, in London have had a number of uh, meetings with uh, their counterparts uh, at the Foreign Office uh, to raise uh, this particular uh, threat and concern. Uh, with regard to trade, um, I don't want to say too much because I think that uh, Mrs. Bacchus, uh, who is from the private sector, uh, will, will speak at greater length about it. Uh, Foreign Minister Greenwich also had uh, made allusion to the fact that uh, the EPA which governs uh, our trading relationships uh, with the United Kingdom, EP obviously with the EU, uh, that once the exit takes place, this will come to an end. I therefore, I will, I will move on. Uh, with regard to the economic and financial, there are a number of concerns. It is feared that the decrease in the value of the pound sterling vis-a-vis -vis United States dollar could lead to a reduction in the number of tourists holidaying in the Caribbean as costs rise for United Kingdom tourists. Moreover, the expected contraction, economic contraction, not only in the United Kingdom, but other European economies as well, will cause job losses. And once there are job losses, it means that uh, persons will have less discre discretionary income, and therefore this could lead to a slowdown in the, or decrease in the number of tourists uh, who come to the Caribbean from the UK and from the European Union. There's also obviously a concern of a general global economic slowdown. Uh, this has been uh, predicted, and uh, some of this was mentioned earlier uh, by, by Dr. Singh uh, when, in, in his presentation on the, the economic dimension of Brexit. Something we need to take into account, of, obviously, with uh, the depreciation of the pound is that investments in the United Kingdom assets would have been negatively affected uh, by the devaluation of uh, the British currency. It also means uh, that uh, if, for example, our central banks have been invested in, uh, in British assets, gilts, and other, other, other type bonds, uh, that uh, there will be losses. 
I will give a simple example. Uh, if Serena Williams had won Wimbledon a month ago, she'd have taken home 2.9 million US dollars. Uh, because she won it uh, just a few days ago, she'd be taking home uh, 2,600, 2 million, sorry, 2.6 million, a loss of $300,000. Just to give you uh, an idea as to the extent at the moment, at the moment, of what has what has taken place uh, as a result of Brexit. I spoke a bit earlier of uh, our diaspora in the UK. Uh, we also take into account that a, a number of members of the diaspora have returned to the Caribbean uh, to, to, pa to pass their uh, having having uh, their resignations, having stopped working. It therefore means that, they rem that uh, their pensions are not going to be worth as much as they were previously. Uh, it also mean, mean that remittances and remittances have become a very important part of, uh, of feeding foreign exchange into the economies of the Caribbean. The remittances, obviously, their value uh, is going to fall off. Uh, with regard to the British Overseas Territories, as British citizens, all depending obviously on the arrangements that are made when the UK finally breaks uh, from uh, the European Union, uh, they could find themselves losing the right to free access uh, and free movement uh, within the European Union. Uh, the quota and tariff free access which they enjoy the, at the present moment uh, uh, could come to an end and the EU funding will be probably lost. Uh, the overseas uh, countries and territories of the European Union uh, benefit uh, from a number of funds uh, and which uh, are obviously uh, very important uh, for the economies of these countries. I've gone very quickly with regard to, to, the, uh, to the impact, as I said, trade, political, economic, diplomatic, but I, we, we tried to, to, to come up with a number of recommendations. Uh, we believe that CARICOM needs to have a structured approach we need to have a common message. We need to have a flexible strategy. And this needs to, to bring together both the technical and the political. Uh, because it's quite clear that uh, there's a whole technical dimension, whether it's financial, whether it's economic, that needs to be borne in mind and not only political. It's going to be very important to keep under review the evolution of uh, the Brexit process. Uh, it hasn't been triggered as yet. As yet. Once it is uh, triggered, it's going to take some two years before it comes, before it comes to an end. But it's, quite, uh, it's very important, therefore, that uh, uh, CARICOM heads of mission, our high commissioners in London, our ambassadors uh, in Brussels, are going to have to follow very closely the developments that will be taking place, both in Brussels with regard to the EU and in London uh, with regard to the UK.